Okay, everybody, welcome back. I hope you managed to get some sort of coffee. I, I have a confession to make. I love FTL. It's my sort of uh, go-to game. Every time I'm on an airplane with no Wi-Fi access, uh, iPad sort of comes out because giant spiders. And I, and I have to say, uh, who loves the weapon pre-igniter? If you get it early on, it's uh, definitely the, the, the way to go. So we're having a fireside chat today with uh, Justin Marr from sort of uh, FTL, um, interviewing him or chatting with him, his uh, Dank, uh, Daniel. Uh, Daniel and his colleagues, I don't think there are any nicer guys in the indie games developer, or everybody from sort of Spry Fox I've ever met are the, the world's sort of greatest and nicest sort of people. So you're in for a real sort of treat today. Uh, a round of applause for sort of two legends of the indie game industry. Thank you. Is this on? Testing. Uh, testing, testing. Can you hear us? Can we uh, turn on the uh, mics on the stage, please? Hello, hello. Hello. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. <laughs> Dude, twelve. All right. I'm going to assume you can hear us. So, um, I'm Daniel Cook. Tell us about yourself. You're, 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 we're going to sort of have a, a chat, and we're going to go back and forth, and uh, theoretically, we're going to talk game design, but it may turn into something else. But let's just start us off. What are you excited about? What have you done? Yeah, so I'm Justin Ma. I'm half of the official team at Subset Games, although we rely on a lot more people than that to make our games. We, the only game we've published so far is, uh, is Faster Than Light, of course, although we're currently working on Into the Breach, which we're quite far along on as we've been working three long years on it. But um, it's uh, still a bit of a ways to go, but it's going well. Uh, I previously worked at 2K Games for a little while, and then where I met Matt, my partner, we broke off and just sort of decided to have some fun screwing around making little prototypes, and eventually that became FTL. Um, so I feel like a lot of the core design of FTL came from the fact that it was just two guys screwing around not expecting to actually release a game so much as just make something they themselves want to try. Right. So, so the prototype had room to to breathe and be what it needed to be without like deadlines and schedules and people saying like, no, you can't do that. Yes, yeah, that was kind of the whole point also is to start with, Matt really wanted to work on something where he didn't have to work on other people's code, right? He wanted, <laughs> to, he wanted to have full, complete control over absolutely everything. So that was a big impetus for this. I, I'm gonna I'll put up a screenshot in case people don't know what FTL is. Who, so. who here has played FTL? <laughs> All right, all right. So, those so are, there's some mild familiarity. <laughs> um, yeah, the concept of FTL it started just trying to give people the feeling of being Picard, the ca captain of a spaceship. Um, a lot of games let you be a pilot or be a commander, but very few games let you feel like, oh, I'm telling the people to solve the individual problems going on. So that was like the core principle, but that as a game, that could manifest in tons and tons of different ways with actual game design. I feel like the, the two elements maybe that really <laughs> defined what FTL came to be over time were when we decided to focus on like the crew manipulation and like their positioning in, in the layout of the room and then also the power distribution. Those two things sort of set a chart for what FTL would become. Um, so, so I'm always curious about this because when we see games that are released, they, the, we found the fun we know what it is. There's, there's all these little experiments that happened and were thrown away, mm -hmm. and like we only see we only see the end result. Um, there's I look at this, and as a game designer, I'm like, this was a project that was developed organically. Mm -hmm. Like there was not like one idea that was your key idea, and then you nailed it on first attempt, and then you shipped it. Um, so tell me, lead, tell me some of the. So tell me some of the uh, origin of some of these pieces on the screen. Like, what were some experiments you tried? What were some that didn't, didn't work out? Yeah, um, that definitely describes the way that we work. Uh, yeah. we, I couldn't imagine trying to come up with a game design document and then actually having it be fun when you make it. Everything we make is terrible until we yep. iterate and iterate and iterate. Um, yeah, one of the earliest things that this game was, there was no fighting, there was no combat. All it was was a bunch of asteroids flying at your ship, and you had to move your crew around to put out holes and fire and stuff. And like that was one of the early moments that we were like, OK, that actually just moving crew around in itself is fun. Um, 
there's a lot of like vestiges from that old design. The fact that every room is both broken into individual squares is because there's a lot more minute movement that you can do. We also had like directional shields, like uh, X-wing versus Tie Fighter, because I love that mm -hmm. game. I mean, who doesn't? Um, we also had movement around, like you control the positioning of ships based on the other ships around there. But all of that just felt totally not necessary to what the core experience was, which was just feeling like you're commanding. You don't even have to be. Just give you the feeling as if you are giving high-level decisions and let the, your imagination fill in all those other gaps. Sure. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, great. There we go. Um, and um, so you say, like, being Picard. Like, that's a wonderful, tight, like, <laughs> vision statement. Mm. At what point, what percentage of the way along into the, into the prototyping was that you're sort of like, you, you, you came up with that? That was the first sentence that described what the game would be. And then so just, just everything else about the game was us trying to figure out a way to give the player that feeling. Gotcha. So, you know, it, to give that feeling, you could have ended up a game that's more like Battlestar Galactica, where you are worrying about morale of people and worrying about food supply and water. Like, that would fulfill my goal of, uh, or our goal of having that feeling of being a commander. It just so happened that the first tests that we did were based on this crew movement. And then so since that was kind of fun, we just kept going with that. But the, the primary goal was just a feeling that we wanted the players to have while playing the game. Everything else is just fluff. Like. So, so you started with that, that core idea from the very, very beginning. Yeah. That was the reason you were prototyping. Yeah. And then it was all about finding the mechanics. Finding that's what's so, fun. Yeah. yeah. We yeah, had no idea what was actually emotional. fun, right? So yeah. we know we want, what atmosphere we want to give, but then like, how do you make a game out of that is, was with the prototyping phase, which for FTL, I must say, it was remarkably smooth. Uh, there were nice. some ups and downs, but it was like three months until we had basically what was the game. Um, and then, you know, the whole game took uh, 18 months. And uh, most of that was, you know, beta testing and, and getting ready to launch and all that. Um, so it was like a ridiculously fast um, process. Mm -hmm. that, that is, when that comes together like that, it's like, it's magical. Yeah, it was, um, I mean, the whole process along, we had no idea that people would like this game. We thought mm -hmm. that we were making something that was just entirely for us, people who are very masochistic, like don't, <laughs> you know, this game is just, Brutal intentionally. We there was no way to win it for the longest time. There was no win state. You just play until you lose, and we enjoyed that. Um, and so there was a lot of concessions that we made um, as we had beta testing and everything. But from its core, it was just something that we ourselves wanted to play, which I think, you know, is a great reason for its success, but also the cause of a lot of the bad elements of design that I would consider in it. That's a lead if I've ever heard one. So bad elements of design. Like looking back on this, it's been years now. It's been three years since you shipped it. Uh, you've changed five years. Five years. Yeah, it's been you, a long you've, time. you've probably changed a lot as a as a designer. Yeah. In that time, like uh, I, I look. At, we'll talk sure. about your new game in a bit. But like, there's elements of your new game that I can look at and I say, wow, everything's a lot more tight. Mm. Like a lot. More, there's more elegance. There's like like this. This is a very organic game. Your new game has some of those elements, but it's a lot tighter of a game. Um, looking fair. back on FTL, what, what do you look at now and, and cringe? Um, there were a couple, a lot of people, what they talk to uh, first about not liking the game is like the randomness element. And I'll address that, I guess. But to me, that's not, that doesn't bother me so much. I, I'm used to playing board games. I'm used to the whole like you have a deck of things and you just flip a card and you deal with it, you know? So that doesn't bother me so much. Um, there's ways that we could have addressed the randomness that makes it less scary and less awkward for players. Like if we were more concerned about the end games, the end users' experience in terms of that, then we could have improved that randomness element. But like specific things that make me kind of cringe, I really um, the one of the core ways the game flows out, if you don't know, is the individual systems on the ship can get broken. Your shields can go down, you no longer have shields. Your weapons can go down, you need to fix that before you can fire. 
the only thing that's persistent is your health bar for the entire ship. Once that is destroyed, the whole ship is just broken. But if, even if you have one health bar, you can repair back to full capacity, essentially, of effectiveness. And I really don't like that anymore. I really, um, I would prefer to have some sort of feeling of a long-term permanence during the battle of a progression towards like um, a more dangerous state rather than just this ability to reset and fix and reset and fix within like 15 seconds of battle. I'm not a big fan of that. I also, one of the ways that we tried to build the world of the FTL was to make it as, frankly, as boring as possible because we wanted to rely entirely on people's sort of shared collective knowledge about sci-fi, rather than being like, here's our sci-fi, read all this stuff, now that you're up to speed, now you can experience the game. We kind of just wanted to skip all that and just say, use whatever preconceptions you have about sci-fi and then put that into this game, and just to get that out of the way. And like, so that the actual story of the game is the like minute to minute experiences of your crew. So um, we had a lot of events in FTL that were sort of more dramatic and more interesting and maybe have the most um, uh, people have the strongest memories about, like cutting the red or blue wire or whatever, mm -hmm. or like the guy on the moon who goes crazy, or the giant spiders. But like, and that's all great, but I kind of wish we could have even gone more generic and more abstract and more distant from, from clear descriptions about the game and more uh, like not clearly describing events that are happening and leaving it up to players' imagination or building that directly into the game mechanics, which is what we tried to do with Into the Breach. But um, so, so that you could have this re replayability thing and have this feeling of exploring the universe without having to read tons and tons of text. Gotcha, gotcha. This is actually a big challenge with uh, games, especially as the, as the marketplace gets more crowded. Um, uh, there's a term, uh, the mega text. Have, have you heard of that one? No. So it's this idea that, um, like, say, fantasy novels. Fantasy novels all tend to exist in kind of the same universe. Mm. You know, there's yeah. there's some elves in one, there's some dwarves in another, and but it's kind of all this shared big sure. universe they live within. And um, one of the challenges that we have as as game developers is when we try to build our own worlds, our audience has this very deep cultural knowledge of a particular megatext. Like, they know what spaceships are supposed to work like. They yeah. know what uh, Star Trek is supposed to work like. And if you go too far, if you get too specific, then you're basically preventing people from accessing your world. Mm. Um, and at the same time, if you get too generic, um, then, at, then at a certain point, they're like, "Wait, I don't, I don't recognize that this anymore. I don't, I, I yeah, want I have no frame of reference. I, like, what I want a character like Riker. He doesn't need to be named Riker, but I want him in there. I want, you know, this this type of alien, or you know, the lizard aliens, sure. and the so on and so forth. Um, so I, I don't know. That's a that's a it's a it's a delicate thing to navigate. I, um, I think um, video games has one. Uh, benefit co compared to other media in that regard, in that um, it had, we have gameplay and interaction, right? Mm -hmm. You can have a game with no story, no, no setting, no nothing. It could be lines, and it could be super fun that you put tons and tons of hours into. So uh, on our side, we're always very heavily gameplay oriented. I love world building, and I love storytelling. I cannot do it for the life of me. Um, so we p heavily, heavily focus on mechanics and mechanics alone. So even if you have a, like you describe, a game that poorly goes way too far into the abstract and undefined, if the game is fun itself, it could still be a great game. So unlike uh, like if this was a book or something, then that just wouldn't work. People wouldn't be engaged. But you don't have to be engaged to enjoy playing Magic the Gathering or whatever. You, know, you don't have to care about the lore at all. Um, so I think that that's a, one thing that we can draw off of. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a, a, an idea, so there's, uh, there's two types of stimuli uh, okay. that uh, when you're, when you're uh, skinning a game mechanic, there's sort of uh, uh, evocative stimuli, mm -hmm. which is like, there's something very emotional that happens, like a person dies, and it's like, oh, a person died, and I had a relationship with them, I feel bad about that, because I should feel bad about people dying. Mm -hmm. um, then there's also sort of functional stimuli, which is um, uh, in... It, when you look at um, the design of everyday things, you know they talk about like it's a it's a it's a it's a door handle, and it should look like a door handle because sure. it's like 
well, you know, if you put a, if you put a black spot in the upper right-hand corner, nobody's going to know that that's how you open the door. Yeah. Um, and so when we were building these, um, these abstract games, I build abstract games, you build abstract games, a lot of times what I'm, I'm thinking of is like, okay, there's the evocative stimuli, which we're bad at, and a lot of people who write novels are very good at, but like, what we really need to focus on, what we really need to nail is that functional yeah. stimuli. What are the affordances? What tells you what you can do and how you can do and what it will do? Yeah, that's a really good point. I think we've, um, I've never thought about these as like as sort of abstract concepts of design. I'm, I'm, um, I probably should so that I can give talks better and like <laughs> formulate my concepts of reasonings behind design and talk about them clearly, but I just don't, I don't do that for some reason. But yeah, so that's, I think that's something that we, organically realized with FTL and are trying to uh, deal with with Into the Breach, where I, I swear the m most time we spent on that game is the UI and, and the way that you're conveying the information that needs to be given to the player so that they can at least make informed decisions. And, but you have to do it in such a way that you don't feel like, here's what you do to do this. And then there's no sense of discovery and no sense of um, you know, ownership over the game mechanics that the players can feel. Like one of the other things I kind of regret with FTL, like there's so many details of mechanics that aren't clearly um, told to the player. For example, like the crew in the, that room fighting those three guys. In the game, it, there's a hierarchy of positioning. So like the left, upper left room is usually the first tile that they go to and then there's alternating. So for example, something that I would do all the time because I made the game um, is in a situation like this where one crew is dying, you pause the game, you tell one to move away, the guy in the first spot to move away, the second spot to move away and back, and then the, the first guy to move back, and they'll just swap positions because the, you've, you've now set that which person's gonna go in the first spot and which person's gonna go in the second spot. And there's so many things like this that are just like, if you know the, the core mechanics of the way the game is set up and, and designed, you can manipulate and work with them in interesting ways. And we never tell that to the player. Even if they discover that after 60 hours or something or find it online, it's like so non-helpful to most people, mm -hmm. yet it, it may you know, be influencing my perception of the difficulty of the game, for example. Um, so with, this is one of the things I think were, were like flaws in game design. We didn't think that far to the user's point of view in terms of experience and, and interaction. And so like with Into the Breach, we're trying to like cut out all of that so that absolutely every possible way that the game is interacting is known and visible to the player. Even if we don't tell you why, and even if we don't tell you what to do with that, and like you, there's many ways that you as a player can interact with these things and make your own decisions, at least the way the game works is clear. And it, you know, it's, so it's like a board game. Like, that's, the, that's the end game goal, is that you could see the rules, and then once you know the rules, if you're that type of gamer, you can think about how to use those rules to your best benefit and that sort of thing. So, so I want to get into, into the breach, but okay. you've mentioned board game a couple times now. <laughs> um, there's clear influences of board game DNA in FTL and in your new game. Tell me about that. Um, so Matt and I, uh, my partner, business partner, other half subset, we first bonded together beside, outside of work playing lots of board games like um, uh, Battlestar Galactica and, and Twilight Imperium and, and sort of heavy strategy big games. Um, there is a couple of core things that we love about board games that you don't see that often in normal games, um, video games. It's just like complete clarity of rules. You know the exact percentage chance there's, you know there's it's a die roll, there's six sides, it's easy. Uh, you know exactly how the, the randomness works, whether it's a deck of cards, whether it's like a programmed AI, like in Battlestar Galacta. So all these sort of like basic clear pieces of game design is given to the player and is made aware of the player. So that's something that we utterly adore. The other, one other thing is like small, breaking apart game, uh, game pieces into like clear chunks. So rather than uh, one game where you have 15,000 hit points and you know, your attack is 1,000 to 12,000, depending on whatever random numbers. Are. We like games that are like, all right, you have two hit points. Like one, you could block or you could not. Like, and so like having just totally clear understanding of um, 
those pieces is something we really, we really like. I, I love that. that we, we do the same thing. I, I think of it in terms of like chunky resources. I use the same terminology. Mm. It's like if, if something could be one to a thousand, can you make it, can you make it one to 10? Can yeah. you make it one to two? Like, can you make it zero to one? And uh, whenever you reduce these things down, reduce it down to the point where you have as much choice as possible with the least number of elements. Yeah, uh, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, I think just growing up, like the allure of, you know, strength and dexterity and whatever in a Final Fantasy game, and then like, oh, the numbers are going up. I don't really get why, um, but, you know, that makes me feel good. I feel like that has worn off like a decade ago. That, that just has no more impact on me. I need to know exactly what's going on so that I can make informed decisions about what I want to do. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's just my bias because that was my progress. I just kind of feel like that is a more like um, mature way to look at playing a game. It's less about total suspension of disbelief and just getting lost and is more about like strategy and focus and, and mm -hmm. clear decision making. Um, but that's, again, just bias because that's something that I personally like doing. But I assume that lots of people do too since, you yeah. know. I, I, think, I think there's something, something going on here. Um, ultimately, we're dealing with human beings and human beings have sort of limited cognitive capabilities. Mm. Um, board games are the way that they are because you have to keep the whole game in your head. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, we got three or four people around a table, and uh, we've got no computers, and you, you've got to, like, deal with people's working memory. How much can you actually hold in your head? Not that much. Yeah. Um, and uh, by, by, by limiting our games to what people are capable of, we actually make our games more playable. Um, so those small numbers, like small number of elements, things that people can think about and, and like, reason, reason about, um, just because a computer can do something does not mean we should make a game do that. Um, yeah, and I agree with you, and uh, I hope you're right in terms of making it more playable, because like, um, I could put up Into the Breach screenshot. Just, oh, yeah, let's, um, let's jump to that. We talk about that a bit. Um, but you may notice, it, you can get... I try and make things as readable as possible, but like, there's possible ways that... like. You may be doing too much, and so I'll, I'm curious once I'll get pe more general people's feedback on whether or not the game is actually readable and playable, because, um, uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> so so just, just breaking this down here, what do you got? You've got an, an 8 by 8 grid, are most of them 8 by 8? Yeah, so the, it's a tactics strategy game, extremely minimalistic. Setting is giant monsters versus mechs. Um, Every battle is on an 8 by 8 grid that's with partial uh, random generation within it. Um, and like I was trying to say before, uh, everything is very granular, everything is very clear. Um, so the core concept with this game, like the principle that we were trying to work with, like the captain uh, concept, was just we watch these movies like Man vs. Steel, we see them destroy the whole city, no one gives a crap. Like it's just fluff, it's just explosions. And so we wanted to have a game where you feel like you have the ability to protect the whole city and the responsibility to protect the whole city. So in this game, the, your mechs can die, your pilots can die, all that matters is you keep the city from being destroyed. Um, so that was like the core principle. Um, and then in, in our way of development, which is a lot of trial and error, this game, it took a lot longer to get to the final game. It took like two years of throwing out six months of design over and over again. It was very, very painful. <laughs> but um, to eventually get to this, to where we are now, is trying to achieve that one feeling in the player. So specifically, the way the game works is you have, generally have three mechs that are on your side, these three, these three greenish, tanky looky things and stuff, and a whole bunch of monsters that come and go. All the battles are super short, they're super, like condensed into a, like a couple turns only of decision making, but everything that the enemy is going to do is clearly visible to you. So for example, the flying guy in the upper right, um, if you were to end your turn and not do anything, he would attack that building. This guy down here, this line, dotted line, means he's going to attack your tank for one damage is what that guy does. And so um, when you get to every single turn, you know everything that the enemy is going to do, and then your job is to react to that. This is like, because in games, a lot of strategy games, like Advance Wars or StarCraft or any of that, you're basically trying to emulate two players playing the game together 
and then you have to do the job better than them. And um, I've never really liked that sort of interaction so much. And I also am, we're not very good at designing AI. Mm -hmm. So we tried to come up with a system that kind of circumvents that and is, um, lets you have these complex, interesting decisions without having to worry about the difficulty coming from whether or not the AI acts smart. You know, like in FTL, like if the AI attacked your weapon systems every time, you, the game would be zero fun. You would lose every all the time. It would, it would be awful. Um, so we wanted to have a game where you don't have to worry about the enemy making good or bad decisions. It's challenging and fun regardless of how stupid the AI is. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, the, uh, there's a long tradition in tactics games and like chess and Go and things of that nature where it's like player versus player. And we've imported a lot of that into sort of gaming culture, computer gaming culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like, oh, obviously the AI has to be smart and I have to beat and dominate the AI. Yeah. But in some sense, uh, some of these uh, computer games, are, they're, more about, they're almost like a, a, a puzzle as opposed to like a strategy game. Now they're an interesting type of puzzle. They're uh, very open-ended. There's lots of different solutions to them. They're not like Sudoku where there's one solution and mm. if you don't get it, you failed. Um, so there's these open-ended but single-player uh, puzzles. And in that point, the AI isn't really a, uh, you know, a human opponent that your goal is to dominate. It's more like part of the environment that you're manipulating and yeah. understanding. Can you successfully break down what the AI is doing and then find a way to beat them. Like in StarCraft or whatever, it would be you're trying to figure out exactly what pace the, the enemy builds its, its structures and when it attacks so that you can go in and, and beat it. So no matter how good the AI is, it's, it's kind of creating a player versus designer concept rather than a player versus game concept, in my opinion. It's like a lot of games, even platformers, you're trying to, as a player, you're trying to figure out what does the designer want you to do and can you do it? Um, whereas this, I like making games where I myself get surprised while I play it and mm -hmm. I'll be like, oh, I never thought that such interaction would happen. So I like trying to make systems that work with each other and dynamic, so systems that are individually very uninteresting and simple, like FTL, oxygen spreads when doors are open, right? Like that's a boring, stupid, small thing. But when you combine that with venting, uh, breaches, fire, borders, doors, like that becomes more of an interesting concept. So I really like you build your game design out of small, concrete, little minuscule design elements, and you let them sort of just have at it with each other and combine in weird ways that you would have never expected. So um, I strive to keep doing that with every game. Like Splunky is a perfect example, in my opinion, of a game, a platformer that is not player versus designer, it's player versus game world, game experience. Because um, you know all the elements in the game very easily, you know, the thing that shoots an arrow, jumping, bombs, and then so your job is to figure out within the specific game itself, can you, can you beat the game rather than can you beat what the designer sort of intended you to beat. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a, like these systems are almost like miniature physics systems. Like, mm. like here you've got a pushing mechanism. So like if you, uh, um, if that enemy is going to attack your, uh, your tank there, you could push them and suddenly they're, if you push them too far, maybe they'll end up attacking a building. But there's a very predictable thing that they're going to do. And you're like, oh, this is the physics of the world. Now as the player, I'm, my, my, what I'm bringing, what my brilliant thing that I'm bringing to this game is uh, I understand the physics and I can manipulate it yeah. uh, in order to get outcomes that I desire, which in my mind is sort of the, uh, the definition of strategy. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's the element that I like most about playing our game and watching other people play it. For example, like you're saying, a lot of the game has to do with manipulating your enemy positions and so and manipulating your own unit positions to get an outcome you like. You can have a situation where if you just hit end turn and the enemy attacks, you'll lose, but just by doing a few little smart manipulations, now you have the enemy all killing each other and like blocking other enemies from coming out and uh, this cascade of effects just based on um, like two little minor shifts that you did. So it's incredibly satisfying to, to stare at something that seems impossible and then come up with some bizarre way to, to swing it in your favor. So like with this game, for example, the first time that you 
uh, push an enemy so that it hurts another enemy, that's like an aha moment that you feel really good about. But then there's so many like little minor levels that I, of that aha moments, like the first time that you attack your own unit, damaging it, just so that it gets in enough distance that it can run over and save whatever building. Or, you know, there's like the way you use a weapon that you never had perceived to use. Like there's a, a grapple thing that pulls a unit all the way towards you. So yeah, you can use it to pull a unit to safety, or you could stand in front of water and then pull it across the water and it falls in the water. So it's like, and then it dies. So it's like that, those sort of like, oh, I didn't think I could use this in that way moments are what I think is most compelling about this game. Um, yeah, that, that's, uh, th it's, uh, uh, I want to go back to like board games versus like uh, console games and like some of the, some of the, uh, player, uh, designer versus, um, designer versus player type stuff that goes on. This is just a thing that I've been noticing a lot. Like, mm -hmm. we come from these di sort of different, uh, backgrounds. Like, I really like board games, so I, I developed this type of game. I really like console games, and console games are all of a particular lineage and a particular yeah. way of, of doing things. Mindset. Um, and, um, so, uh, this type of game, the idea that you, you come across a challenge, you have an aha moment where you kind of develop this, this tool. You develop a cognitive skill. It's like, I know how to push things, or I know how to push my own units to do things. Um, and, uh, and then the next time you run into that, you can reuse it. Yeah. In console games, that almost never happens. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, there's a particular jump plat platforming area you, you have to jump it and, or fight this boss in a very particular way. Maybe they'll reintroduce that element again one or two, two more times later on in the game, but for the most part, it's like there's not a lot of transfer of skill. You don't learn something and then do it again later in, same, in the same way. I think they do, but it's curated. It's curated, curated. Sk skills. So for example, yeah. Zelda, like, um, you know, older Zelda, like, you go into the area where you get the bow, and then here are your lessons for how to use the bow to interact with the mechanics that we have. And then every time that they put that eye in that room, you know, you've now learned the skill that they want you to learn. Yeah. And so it exists, but yeah, it's, it's just pure scripted. Um, you know, I guess Breath of the Wild is a good example of, of them stepping away from that. And, Trying to. Yeah, Trying to. E in, even, even there, like there's there's, yeah, a there's lot vestiges of, of there's the very old design, set pieces yeah. where like they are signaling very clearly you need to do this here. But they do let you yeah. do what I like to do and just like give enough space so that if the player wants to use these things mm -hmm. and these mechanics and come up with his own ways of solving problems, they can. Yeah. Even you're not required to to even you're not required to do the win. You're not required to even have fun. But the fact that you let the player sort of develop its own, their own sort of style and and you know principles of, of interacting with a the game, then you know that's much more compelling to me as mm -hmm. a as a player and as a designer um, to like let the player throw themselves into the game. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's wonderful. Um, it, it's it started to be such that whenever I see that sort of like heavily authored static content. Um, I think of it as a dead world. I'm mm. like, oh, this is a dead world. This, is, this means I, I'm, I'm not allowed to have fun within this. Yeah. Uh, uh, my, my, my reason for being here is to execute the pattern that the designer has set up for me. And, maybe, and, yeah, and I instantly lose interest in the game. Maybe this is bad that we just the two of us are up here <laughs> talking because we both strongly agree about this. Like, <laughs> when I play games nowadays, like, if I feel like it's every element of the game is going to be told to me what to do. I just instantly stop caring. Even yeah. if I want to see the game world, even if I like the story, I'll just be like, I, I got other things to do. <laughs> like, right. There's other things right. I could learn. Right. Yeah. I, I suspect we're both uh, systemic thinkers. Mm. So like that's you know that's you know the the tiny one percent of the population. Um, but uh, I didn't. Yeah. It is. Uh, it, it is. I don't know. More games should be for us anyway. Yeah. Or well, at least we can make them. That's. The <laughs> Yeah. Um, so tell, tell me a little bit more about some of the UI decisions you've made here. Because oh, uh, yeah. like, like, I played this briefly this weekend because you sent me a code. And um, that was like, there's a lot of UI going on here. And it's tight. Because th there's a, um, turn based systems are hard. Like, well, you have some benefits with turn based systems, right? Yeah. One, you've got time. You've got time to explain things, which yeah. is great. 
Um, however, they're also very abstract, and abstract things are really hard to tell people about. Yeah. Like, if I throw a ball at you, you'll just catch the ball, and you'll be like, oh, what, what's the big deal here? Mm. If I'm like doing a turn-based system, and I'm like, well, I'm setting traje yeah. uh, a trajectory on this thing, and I have to tell you where it's going. And, and how and it's time like, works. How, yeah, <laughs> how does time work? Yeah. Um, and so, so it's, what are some of the challenges that you ran into here, and like, how did you solve them? I feel like um, we, by our self-imposed like, principles, we've set a lot of challenges for ourselves. Specifically, we just do not want any nested menus. Like, we're trying to not have any, like, fine if you have one menu, but like, don't, don't rely on going deeper and deeper. Like, that's fine if that's the type of game that you're going for, but we're trying to go for like a very minimalistic, very everything's clear from the one screen type of game. And so from the beginning, being able to tell absolutely everything that's going on at one time was kind of a high priority. Also, I have a sub goal in my mind of like, I want to be able to take a screenshot and know absolutely everything about the game thing, post it online, say, what do I do here? And then they would be able to like tell, give you a suggestion, as opposed to saying, oh, my guy has this much dodge and like this much of the ability, just to be able to know absolutely every element of the game. Um, one, the, the biggest problem is, is showing what's going on with the enemy intentions. It's really easy as someone who knows what the enemies um, can do to be able to look at this and know exactly what's going on. But as, as you still have to teach those design mechanics to different people, it's very challenging to, make, uh, to concisely show what they're doing and also you know, allow the game to get complex. Like if you play in a later missions, it just gets so nuts. You have like tons of like spiders spreading all over the place and like these guys that hold your units down and, and like things encased in ice and enemies doing something to affect each other to make them stronger. It's just like so much complicated shit going on. But the, the way that we tried to achieve that was we basically shifted the game design to work with the UI. So for example, like, Every enemy and most units do one thing and one thing only. Um, you can, ex with the, as you play through the game, I guess I didn't describe this, but it's kind of like FTL where your, your units can improve. You add power to their, to their each individual mech and you can add systems or different weapons. But in general, he's like, there's the guy that runs up and punches things. There's the guy that like shoots a projectile that pushes a unit. Um, and the enemies similarly are all super, super micro, um, you know, they could do one thing. And so when you, right. know, when you know that there's such a limited uh, skill set of the enemy and you still see what's going on in the battle, it's very easy to, once you become accustomed with the game mechanics, to know exactly what to do. So like, that's one way that we restricted the game design so that it fit our requirements for the UI. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. So when, I, when I, I see a lot of new game designers, one of the things they do is they come up with this beautiful abstract game you know, mm -hmm. that works in, and they know how to play it and they understand how to play it and they under, they're, they're very confused why nobody else enjoys the game. Um, and then they're like, oh yeah, and I'm like, well, what about the UI? And they're like, oh yeah, well, you know, UI is this like thing that you slap on on top of the game. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and, and, and it's like, uh, and, and, in, and in, in my mind, UI is sort of like one of the key fundamental steps of game design. Because it's like, what does the player understand? What does the player do? You know, like that, that is like, that informs the UI, but it also informs what the game actually is. Yeah, I think, you know, it was similar with FTL. The, the UI requirement of showing power of systems in FTL meant mm -hmm. that we need to be very granular. Each power equals, power in FTL represents how well the system's running, how much reactor you're using in it, the strength of the system, um, whether or not it's damaged. There's so many things jammed into that, like little power bars, that that alone really structured the way the game would, would run. So I think we definitely, because we want to make complex games that have a lot of inter interacting components, that you have to think from the UI from the get-go. I kind of, after this game, want to make a game that has no UI, like just like a platformer that maybe just has like a, some like collectibles on screen and like that's it, because this is, doing this, uh, you, you know, it's easy to do UI that has all the information you need in a bad way. Like that's, mm -hmm. it's there, but you have to find it and they're nested and it's just, that's easy. 
Um, having a UI where it's like super clear is so challenging. I don't think we did perfect, don't get me wrong, but like getting to this point alone was just so much work and uh, um, it's maybe one of the more proud things I am about the game is the fact that we can give it to new people and they can understand what's going on. Like yeah. <laughs> that wasn't the case for a long time. So, so yeah. I'm, I'm kind of proud I don't, of I don't mean to compliment you up here, but like, like when <laughs> I, the first thing I noticed when I started playing the game, I see, I look at a lot of different games. The first thing I noticed is like the, it was the interface. Mm. I was like, ooh, these are, <laughs> these, are, these are hard problems that are being solved well. Um, and it's, it's lots of little pieces. It's like, it's the visualization of the board. It's like when you, like there's some mouse overs when you mouse over some things, like what information you're telling you, when you select an object, what information it's telling. And all of them tie in together to say, this is what is going to happen if you do this thing. Um, it's like, oh, if you attack here, you're gonna lose one health, you're gonna push this guy back, and he's probably going to attack this other thing here. And it's like super crystal clear um, I've seen a lot of games that fail doing that. Yeah, one of the, you know, because the, each battle is so short, for example, four rounds, right? Four times that you get to interact with a battle at all, basically. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of, to make the game fun and interesting and challenging, we try to make the majority of all the weapons not to have multiple, multiple purposes, right? So. This isn't a game where you just smash the units until they die, and if you do it faster than they do it towards you, you win. That's just not the way it works at all. Very often, you will not do damage specifically so that you can just delay them doing damage, right? Mitigating damage to the city is key. So, I mean, all this would be easier if you guys could play or see the game, so I'm sorry <laughs> about this abstract. But it's all up. right here, right <laughs> on the screen. Um, but yeah, so like having... Um, weapons that have multiple uses depending on the situation that you want that you're that you're using it in and having them interact differently depending on the enemies you're using against like all that stuff is is very important to me but also like how do you convey that to people and how do you teach people those skills is one of the bigger challenges of game design so so there, there's a there's something that um, and this probably gets into some of the sandbox aspects how are we doing on time uh, we're 43 right now. All right. If you want to, I don't know if we should do questions. Yeah, we could probably do it. Let's do a uh, couple more minutes here and then do some questions. Sure. Yeah. Um, so um, something that's sort of uh, interesting about both these games from a design perspective is the use of uh, persistent resources. So um, here it's hard to see, but that power grid up there, if I understand correctly, like the, your sort of your health of in the game, sort of like, you, you fail if your health goes to zero, is this sort of city power grid. And like, if at some point these giant monsters go and damage a building, or, um, you start losing health yeah. on your city. Um, but what's interesting about that, like that's a great concept, but what made it really intriguing to me is that persists over the course of the campaign. Yeah. Is that correct? Yep. Um, so, so there's, you're not, like, I love, I love games that have like a little interaction loop, mm. uh, and then a bigger interaction loop, and another bigger interaction loop, and yep. they all sort of like the small pieces feed into the big into the big. As ones. you learn more about the big picture, yeah. you start changing and shifting your priorities in the small picture. Yeah, yeah. And, and 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 now you're like managing resources across the entire campaign, and decisions that may have been like kind of trivial. It's like, oh yeah, I got through this mission, but I, you know, I, I lost one, one uh, energy on the power grid. It's like, oh, well, that's not a big deal. You know, I'll heal up the next time. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't heal up. And now like, that's going to change how I play that mission in a huge, huge way. Yeah. I mean, so the individual moment-to-moment -moment challenges of the almost puzzle-like gameplay is one thing, but we did try and have um, a sort of meta structure of the game where you're you're going between these. I didn't talk about the story at all, but it's fine. It's a game design talk. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you're going between these different islands and basically choosing which sort of missions to go within those islands. And so to have some sort of meta persistence of resources is a requirement to allow the player to having shifting priorities. So for example, we really want in the game to not always have the same choice be the best choice in every situation. Like maybe there'll be this pod that appears that you can rescue and it gives you more abilities. But given a specific situation, it may be more important to uh, save the building. It may be way more important to let the building damage. It may be important to attack the building to kill an even stronger enemy. It may be important 
you may be the best decision to let your mech die and let your most important pilot die so that in the rest of the game you may be sort of gimped a little bit, I guess. But um, to have the player be put in these situations where your priorities shift depending on the sort of meta system of the game was a high priority uh, for us. Because otherwise, you're just, you end up, as a player, being a machine. You're just like, do the thing that's best in every time, go, go, go. But mm -hmm. when you have to be like, all right, I have to sacrifice my guy this, in this one situation. I hate doing it. That is like strong uh, interaction, in my opinion. And that's like, yeah. if we achieve that, that will have been a success in my mind. That, that's awesome. There's a, there's a, um, a philosophy here. Our, our game's experiences in which we have a nice experience, we have a nice experience, we have a nice experience, that's all authored. Or are games these sandboxes and toys where we get I mean, to be? Games are everything. That's, the games that's, are everything, yeah. right? But these are different philosophies sure, of yeah. games, and, and all, both are valid. But like, as a designer, we have an we, we make aesthetic choices. Yeah. And like we decide what type of game are we going to make. Um, and uh, like, if you're making an RPG and your party heals up after every single battle, mm. that's a very you know you know, set, authored, experience type of game. If you're going and you're having these resources that you have to worry about and manage, and there's this whole other layer of, like, um, cause and effect strategy uh, in the campaign itself, that's a very different choice. Yeah. Um, which, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I could only make games that I myself want to play, right? Like, yeah. I can't imagine trying to design successfully a game that I don't understand why people enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So, um, this sort of... I think Splunky sort of shifted all my perception of game design, the original one when that came mm -hmm. out. And so now everything since then has been the post-Splunky <laughs> post Justin versus the pre-Splunky Justin. Um, but yeah, so that, that sort of like, let's take the concept of, of the interactive systems of Rogue and let players just have fun with it. It was totally, you know, is now just part of the core of me as a designer. That I, I, maybe I'll get tired of it, but I can't imagine because the whole point of that is things that you can't imagine, uh, things that you never predicted interacting, like, you know, Dwarf Fortress, that whole, like, cat debacle, where, like, just the way that they, if, any, <laughs> if you read about that, like, there's so many amazing little minute things that happen in games like Dwarf Fortress that no one would have predicted that it's just like, that's what the, I love about games. The, it, this example is, uh, he simulated it such that when a cat walks on uh, the floor, it picks up whatever liquids was on the floor, which in a bar happens to be alcohol, but then the cat has dirty paws, so it licks its paws and it gets drunk. Um, and unfortunately, cats didn't deal well with alcohol, so suddenly there were these, uh, they drunk too much and they died, so there would be these hordes of drunk cats, thirsty de dead cats in bars everywhere. And it's this sort of emergent property of these like complex systems that are like, wow, I, I bet uh, Tarn was delighted yes. when he saw that. He was probably like, this is wonderful. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the point of game development, where yeah. it's a certain types of game development where we delight ourselves. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, should we take some questions? Did anyone have any questions? Um, if not, we can keep talking. Every once in a while, I have these like lunches where I meet up with game designers, and it's just it's basically like, oh, we'll meet for an hour, and like two to three hours pass, and we're just like talking to each other. It's like, oh, did you know? Did you see this? What about this idea? And it's very exciting. Yeah, I could talk about game design all day. <laughs> like, it's this is you know, like I said before, it'd be hard for me to give a talk on my my concepts of the game design, but if mm -hmm. I just want to chat, I could do that all day. Yeah. yeah. Any any questions? Uh, hi, uh, awesome game, by the way. Uh, uh, I was kind of curious about its sort of design, sort of like marketing side of things when you were uh, releasing FTL. Um, was there a certain point where you went from that, oh, uh, like, is this working? Are we going to make it? To kind of like, okay, we're, we, we can see that we are picking up traction. We see that we're going somewhere, that it's not going to be a gamble when we release it, or it's not mm -hmm. going to be a flop, or was that was it kind of an organic growth, or was that kind of like a point when you like you, you did something big, and I was like, okay, now we know we're making it. We had a lot of like right place at the right time sort of moments. Um, if you don't know our background, we were doing 
we were just making a tiny game. We released it to a few competitions, got like finalists. People really liked it. We're like, oh, maybe we should try and finish this. Then we did a Kickstarter asking for $10,000. We got, this was like right at the start of games being interesting on Kickstarter, or people being interested in games on Kickstarter because it was when Double Fine did theirs. I, we did the Kickstarter thinking that it was just an excuse for our families to like give us money legitimately. Um, but and we got $200,000 and we had no idea what to do with it and we were totally overwhelmed. Um, then we just kept getting more and more. Every step of the way, it was us um, guessing wrong about the interest by an order of magnitude. Um, like every step of the way. So there weren't a lot of marketing decisions, let's say. <laughs> That's not what we're good at at all. Like I don't, I wouldn't know how to market it if I tried. Um, and everything sort of evolved organically and by word of mouth, which I'm just pure luck from my perspective that it worked out so well. Um, but I, I personally was the optimistic side of the team. Matt was always the pessimistic side of the team where I was like, yeah, people are totally, they may be like this and they may be like, no one would ever like this. And that's still the sort of dynamic that we have uh -huh. going on now. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I still now am shocked at how many people liked FTL. I still, it still doesn't make sense to me that, like, that people like that game so much. And I'm trying with our next game not to shift from our perspective so much of just working on the thing that we want to make and instead trying to like design for our fans because I think that's a dangerous path to go down. So we're just trying to do, trying to keep up with the way that we made FTL, but we'll, we'll see. Um, it is a very different game, so with, I have no idea whether or not the number... We try, well, actually, post-FTL, I, I try to make peace with the fact that that's probably going to be the most popular thing ever in my life, ever. Like, some people would have that game and be like, now let's go even higher heights, and I'm like, no, no, no I'm done. Like, <laughs> I'm, like I'm not going to try and do that. That sounds scary. You, you, um, you, you are wanna... familiar with statistics. You yeah, know how it oh, works. No, like, yeah, I... Uh, we had our Dwarf Fortress like lock ourselves in a room, whatever that's called, brilliant moment. Um, and so um, if that never happens again, I won't be surprised, and it's fine. <laughs> Hi. Uh, first, I want to thank you for saving a lot of flights for me, because <laughs> that was my go-to game on flights for a long time. Nice. Uh, the questions that I have, which you already kind of started to answer, but not really, is um, there was obviously a series of fortunate uh, and maybe some unfortunate events with the game's development, the way that it got hype, the contests and whatnot. Um, looking back at what you guys did and the decisions you made, if you were starting your first game or a game like that today, um, how would you approach that? Maybe not exactly this game or maybe like what kind of game would you try to make today? So I'm basically trying to ask what would you do today if you actually had to make a game, had to ship it, and uh, your future would depend on that? Yeah, I feel like the way that we approached this game design was entirely based on the fact that we, our livelihoods are not reliant on it, right? FTL did well enough that we can spend two extra years beyond what we were expecting. Um, and so I think if I were releasing a game now in the market now that is terrifying and crazy for indie games, um, the highest priority would be that you are risking nothing um, release doing this game. You are not putting your life savings in it. You, you are either, like what we did with FTL, we put aside a year bec living in China because I could live off of a year in like five to $10,000 in China if I'm just eating cheap food, right? So setting it up so that there's no risk to failure would be a high, high priority for me. Um, in terms of how to approach marketing and getting eyes on a game, I have no idea. Um, right now, um, we're basically going to be relying entirely on the fact that FTL was popular, right? Like, um, getting, it seems, if I can make a guess, it seems right now that the only thing that matters to get eyes on games is streamers. Uh, everything else doesn't matter, I'm sorry, press, but like, that just seems to be the way it is now. Like, you can talk about a game as much as you want, but if it's not the type of game that people can see other people playing the game first, be via YouTubers, via YouTubers or streamers, it's just not going to be able to get traction because there are going to be those games that people see the streamers play, and everyone has such a limited amount of time to play games now that, like, that is maybe the most important thing, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts? It's, it's uh... 
it's a hard market right now. I, I, I absolutely agree with the like set yourself up so you can fail and it's okay. Um, like Spryfox is kind of built on that. Like uh, we were looking back through a slide of like all the games we released and how many failures we've had, and the vast vast majority of them fail. Like uh, of like 13 different projects, three of them have been have paid for essentially the last seven years of the company. Mm -hmm. Um, games are dangerous in their ga life, Games yeah. are dangerous, but games are a very bad investment of money. If you are an investor or a VC <laughs> person, you're probably really dumb um, if you're investing in games. Unless you're investing in like 100 and you're fine if 99 fail. Yeah, <laughs> but then even if you're investing in 100, there's better places to invest your Fair money. Fair enough, yeah. <laughs> um, like there's other industries that are more reliable. Um, so uh, for games, like we, like, how do you set it up so that like, you can make the game and fail. And there's, there's ways to do that. You can get uh, funding from someone who does have a large portfolio. You can get funding from people who are like developing a new platform. You can, uh, like, the, the ability to be a hobbyist developer, I think, is like greatly underrated mm -hmm. right now. Like, the ability to like, yes, I have a, a, a job and it's making me money or some savings because I have a job, and then I do development on the side. Um, you don't need a giant team to make a good game. I feel like a lot of people came out um, and wanted to go into indie games recently um, because they see the, the guys who do super well, like, you know, Super Meat Boy and, and the breakout successes and the potentials of that, where I feel like in, like in everything, there's a lot of survivorship bias in terms of, like, yeah. if you copy what I did exactly, it, A, it wouldn't work because the timing's different, but B, it just could have not worked because, like, who knows? Like, there's no way to tell exactly what sort of cascade of, of positive things happened that made us succeed. So it's, every time you get advice about what to do from people like me, take it with a grain of salt, because it, what worked for me is not going to work for anyone else, absolutely. Yeah. Last question. Okay. Last question. Hey, uh, so in uh, both your games, you had a really clear and a really unique direction early on in development. Um, my question is, um, what sorts of processes or you know discussions did you have to m let you land on these these interesting directions as opposed to doing something else? Um, that core sentence about what we wanted the games to be that was based. Both of these games um, were Matt writing a list of things that he would want to work on. I think I'm a little bit more flexible than Matt. Sorry, Matt, in terms of like. He wouldn't want to work on the games that I may be most passionate about. So a lot of it is like, OK, he has this core principle, and then I'm going to find a way to make it into a game that I like. You know, like He doesn't like Ogre Battle, or Final Fantasy Tactics, or Advance Wars, or any of those games. And I do. And so I'm going to jam that in into that core principle as much as possible. Um, uh, to actually find the what was fun out of this sort of high-level concept, I'm not exactly sure the best way to do it. Um, for us, it was you take, you take what the feeling is that you want the player to have, and then you just guess, and you come up with a couple of different ways that you can maybe do that, and you pick the one that is easiest to implement, and you try that, and then you say, okay, this failed, why? Um, and then figure out how to slightly move you towards that um, that general goal. Unfortunately, this this print this style of design also means that we may go down something like this game at first had like a sort of city building mechanic where you're like managing a whole city, um, and that got all scrapped. So um, this you have to be okay with every once in a while taking a big step back and saying, is this exactly what we were hoping the game would come out to be? Because it's so easy to go down that, like a rabbit hole of game design and feature creep and everything. So you have to be able to step back and cut and cut and cut. Like even just now, we, like a week ago, we, we successfully moved closer to development by cutting like a third of what we were gonna put in the game. <laughs> it's like, yay, we we're almost done now. Um, so, so I think, being able to like feel passionate about something, but also being willing to let it go at every stage is a very challenging thing about being a designer, but necessary. Okay, we've reached out of time, but thank, round of applause, that was, that was wonderful. Right? Thank you, everyone. A chance to meet a couple of legends of the, the indie game business.